I really appreciate you guys coming out this evening and, and come to learn about hemlock woolly adalgid and our hemlock conservation strategy for the High Allegheny Plateau. So um, I'm Andrea Hilly. I'm the forest silviculturist on the Allegheny National Forest. And I'm um, just providing an introduction right now to the speakers tonight. And the first one of which will be Dale Lutheringer, who's an environmental education specialist with uh, this, the BCNR um, Cooks Forest State Park. And he's also an expert in old growth and very large hemlock trees across the eastern U.S. And um, Tim Tolman will speak next. And he's waving his hand. He's an entomologist with the Pennsylvania Bureau of Forestry. And then finally, Sarah Johnson, who is a GIS conservationist uh, with the Nature Conservancy, will talk more specifically about the conservation strategy that we've been working on for a few years now for this area. So if you guys, and we're pretty informal. If you have questions, go ahead and ask them um, as they come up. Or Thanks. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah. Uh, well, the title of my talk is uh, Values of Hemlocks and Threats to Their Existence. Uh, if we look at hemlock across the uh, eastern United States, it is uh, very prolific in terms of the acreage that you can find it in. Uh, it's been found or documented in about 19 million acres across the eastern U.S. And out of that, it's uh, one of the predominant species in 2.3 million acres. And uh, here is a view at Cook Forest State Park. And uh, almost everything that you're looking at, all the dark green is all hemlock forest. And almost all of that is old growth forest. And uh, we'll get into that once I get a little bit further. Uh, hemlocks can be found <coughs> in a wide variety of areas throughout the East United States. Uh, from that far south that we know of down in uh, Alabama, all the way up to Maine, up in the bits of uh, uh, Canada, and then all the way out to uh, Minnesota. Uh, it's found on, uh, it can be found really in many different places. Uh, it can be found on ridge tops, in the valleys. Um, a lot of times uh, it doesn't do well in the drier areas, which you can't stress it out, but it does have a wide range of uh, habitats, but usually where we find it most prolific are in uh, well-drained uh, acidic uh, soils. And uh, it's uh, <coughs> often one of the main types. Of, it's really our main conifer type in Pennsylvania. Uh, there's other conifers be predominant would be like white pine. Then you get into your lesser pines like pitch pine and maybe some red pine. But in terms of uh, conifers, hemlock is by far our most uh, predominant conifer. <coughs> Um, oftentimes with hemlock uh, growing in a forest, you'll have uh, green from the canopy from the top all the way down to the bottom. And uh, it's very shady underneath the hemlock forest. And uh, this tree does a lot of its photosynthesis uh, in the winter time when all the other uh, deciduous trees are losing their leaves and kind of going into dormancy. Uh, hemlocks are still out there doing their thing. So that helps to keep these needles fairly, fairly vibrant, and that also contributes to that very dense canopy. So what they end up doing is they'll hold on to a lot of these needles. So you'll have needles from the top, oftentimes down to the bottom, and there's lots of shade underneath there. So uh, hemlocks are very shade tolerant tree species. They can live underneath the canopy uh, in a very shady environment and we might call it being in a suppressed state for decades, if not centuries, until you get a canopy gap uh, that comes out and they can take advantage of that and, and grow faster. Uh, of more than 120 vertebrate species have been found to utilize uh, hemlock stands. Uh, a majority of them really like the, uh, the thick cover that they can get, especially with the, uh, uh, the white-tailed deer. Um, like we had a very cold winter, last winter, and um, a lot of times we'll go out in the woods and find where they're hanging out mostly. It's in these dense hemlock stands. It breaks the wind down. Uh, temperature's a little bit, uh, a little bit warmer, at least less windy. So the wind doesn't cut you to the quick as much. And so a variety of uh, uh, mammals are going to utilize that. Also, there's nearly 90 species of birds that have been uh, uh, identified that use hemlock forests. 
uh, several are uh, significantly associated with hemlock forests. They'll live in other forests, but a lot of them, uh, certain species, really depend on that uh, structure that the hemlock forest provides. Uh, some of these ones that are really uh, uh, been found to be fairly dependent on hemlock forest are listed here. Uh, black burning warbler is documented 40 times more often in uh, old growth hemlock forest compared to uh, uh, other forest types. Black throated green warbler um, is one that's found three and a half times more often, but a certain one of the uh, well, a certain bird study actually found black throated green warblers to be obligate to hemlock stands. So outside of a hemlock forest, you have a hard time finding black burning warblers. Acadian flycatcher is another one that's up there that is uh, often <coughs> quite often in a hemlock forest. Magnolia warbler 45 times as often. Swainson's thrush. 20 times as often, and for Pennsylvania, Swainson's thrush is a, uh, is a threatened species. So uh, we do have really all of these at Cook Forest, and it's kind of interesting when you go to other hemlock forests, once you start learning your birds, you start becoming familiar with a lot of the same types of bird types. Regardless of the, uh, the size or the age class of the hemlocks, you still see these similar uh, uh, birds that are associated with uh, the forest. Like if you go out to a wetland, you're going to expect wetland type birds. If you go into a hemlock forest, these are often the types of birds that you're going to expect to see when you're out there. <clears throat> and when you lose a hemlock forest, your great lid, the, the bird composition, the species diversity is going to change quite uh, readily uh, when, you, when they lose that type of habitat. They're going to go somewhere else generally to find that type of habitat that they prefer. Uh, brook trout, uh, hemlock. One of the main values of hemlock, uh, besides you know providing you know habitat variety of critters, is that uh, they shelter uh, the streams. So when the streams are shaded, that it decreases the temperature of the streams. And uh, colder streams are able to hold uh, more dissolved oxygen. That's what the fish and the aquatic uh, life breathes is the dissolved oxygen. If you have more dissolved oxygen available in a stream, then you can have a greater diversity of aquatic life living in the stream. <coughs> and uh, one study found that brook trout were found three times more often in a hemlock shaded stream compared to a uh, dis deciduous forest that was shaded. Uh, the main, one of the main contributors is that decrease in temperature. Uh, uh, one study had uh, measured water temperature as it was flowing down a ravine from a deciduous leafy forest through a hemlock forest and then back out into a deciduous forest. And they found that the temperature had changed five to seven degrees Fahrenheit as it went cooler, uh, in, as it went into the hemlock shaded forest. Uh, generally, um, a hemlock shaded stream will often have one to two to four degrees Fahrenheit in terms of difference uh, in that. So um, having the cooler streams allows the stream to have uh, to hold more dissolved oxygen. Okay. Uh, there's also uh, there's about 15 different macroinvertebrate types that are strongly associated with hemlock streams. <coughs> some of these are noted here. Uh, we've got alderfly, various forms of caddisflies, some stoneflies. Uh, when you look into these uh, aquatic streams, uh, water that flows through hemlock forest actually um, it helps to <coughs> decrease nitrogen cycling. The detritus or the leaf layer or all the parts of the hemlock is very nutrient poor <coughs> and uh, all that uh, is going to be laying on the forest floor or in the stream as it starts to decay. And uh, so nitrogen cycling is one of the more important things that hemlocks can do. Uh, when the water runs drains through the hemlock forest, it has a greater ability uh, for nitrogen to fall out because the system isn't saturated with nitrogen. The, the system is dominated by hemlock, which doesn't have a whole lot of nutrients in it to begin with. So you have a greater, let's say, filtering capacity uh, for nitrogen to fall out in the soil before it gets into the stream. And um, well, one study had found that uh, when you lose hemlock, from the uh, night from the watershed, uh, all that nitrogen that was held up in the hemlock forest uh, is going to empty out fairly quickly. 
and uh, you might see the effects of high nitrogen for about maybe 10 years or so before the other trees come back in and uh, start to regenerate in that area. And uh, if you have a lot of nitrogen flux going into a stream, it can actually um, increase uh, the ability for nitrogen or oxygen depleting algae to grow in your stream. So if you have less oxygen in your stream, uh, you have a less opportunity for a greater amount of aquatic uh, life to be able to live in the stream. So you've got the shading that the hemlocks provide to keep the temperature low, and also it, uh, it helps for nitrogen uh, to hold the nitrogen into the system longer. So you have decreased amount of nitrogen. So those two things alone is one of the big things that uh, scientists are suggesting that we call hemlock a cornerstone species because so many different things depend on it. So when we're looking at other ecological benefits of hemlock, you know, a lot of what we're thinking of is right in the is right in the now. But we need to be looking in the future as well, and uh, thinking about if we do lose our hemlock stands from a certain number of pests, uh, are we going to be able to propagate that possibly in the future? So there are studies out there uh, that folks will go out and they'll harvest uh, the cones, and then those will be taken to the lab and are grown not just in other places in the United States, but in other countries. Down in South America, I forget the name of the country in South America, they're actually growing cones that we harvested from Cook Forest uh, that have the genetics of those uh, big old hemlocks uh, in there so that at some point, if we lose our hemlock stands, uh, we can, they can be uh, uh, repopulated back to an area. Uh, you can look at uh, different possible resistances to certain pests things of that nature so you don't want to lose the genetics uh, if you do that you don't have a chance to bring them back if you lose them but as long as we have these repositories that's something that's very special we need to be thinking out and that's decades down the line okay next one all right next one we we're talking about that a little bit and um, oh, we're going to get into a little bit with the old growth forests uh, a lot of these forests uh cook forests are <coughs> centuries old uh, some of the oldest hemlocks ever documented um, are suggested to be around uh, uh, the Tynes area, research natural area. And uh, so I know, of course, I have counted rings on trees over there that were maybe 60 feet from the bottom, cut off of a gas line that were almost 400 years old. So, 400 year old hemlock tree, plus however long it took to get 60 years old, or 60 feet tall, excuse me. In an old growth forest, I mean, that could easily be 100 years. And uh, there certainly are hemlocks in the Thai Nesta scenic area that are over 500 years old. How old, we don't really know for sure. But I mean, there's some reports of some over 1,000, but we were never able to really confirm that. But five, 600 is definitely a possibility. Certainly the oldest known in the state right now that's been confirmed is pushing the five to 600 year, year, year range uh, in the uh, Alan Seeger Natural Area, which is uh, just east of State College. Next one. Okay. Um, we think about ecological values, there's also social values, and um, we think about walking through a hemlock forest. To me, it's one of the more special types of forest to walk into. You certainly, with me, I get a certain feel when you walk into it. It's much quieter, uh, and feel, I don't know how, it's hard to explain it other than you get a type of, you may, some folks may experience a type of spirituality, maybe, per se, uh, or a solitude, but uh, a lot of people will go to a hemlock forest and uh, uh, to enjoy that aspect of it. Um, I know growing up, you know, one of the most common forest when I grew up, up in northwestern Pennsylvania, was, you know, a deciduous forest, mostly sugar maple and beech. Uh, but the hemlock forest, there weren't very many of those, and when you got into those, it was just, Totally different experience. Okay. Um, <laughs> and uh, when you go into a lot of these older forests, you're going to have big trees. So uh, we're going to take a look at some of those here in just a minute. Uh, but just because a hemlock forest may not have big trees doesn't mean it's not special. But a lot of times, our old growth forests in northwestern Pennsylvania are ones that have really are mostly untouched are hemlock dominated. And uh, so we'll take a look at some of those. And a lot of people like to hike, go birding. Next one. And uh, there is also room for discovery. We made uh, uh, several 
I say small scale discoveries at Cook Forest, not just Cook Forest, but around the state in terms of uh, uh, size and uh, in terms of girth, state champions, tallest ponds. And we'll look at some, uh, some of the biggest ones at Cook Forest, and we'll look at some of the large ones uh, uh, really across the eastern United States. So they're very special areas, and um, there's not very many of them around once you get out of areas such as Cook Forest and a lot of the Allegheny National Forest area. But, so we go to Cook Forest. Right now the tallest known hemlock in the northeastern United States is this tree. Uh, we call this the Seneca hemlock, and this one's uh, a little over 147 feet tall and uh, around 9,000, a little over 9,000 board feet of wood in this tree. Now all of that probably isn't marketable. What we do is uh, we, we estimate the volume of wood in the tree and then translate that number into what most people can understand is a board foot rating. So, uh, next one. This is the same tree uphill looking down. That's a six foot pole for to give you an idea for scale. We still don't have the whole tree. Okay. And this was the old state champ. This one's no longer alive. This was near the, the campground, but this is very large. Anytime you walk through uh, the forest and you find a single stem hemlock that's over 12 foot around, it's very hard to do. To find one almost 14 feet around is like in Pennsylvania, is like finding a needle in a haystack, unless it's growing out in the field somewhere. But back in the woods, uh, these are very special. And this one was, we probably modeled this one a little over 10,000 board feet. Next one. Same tree, backing up. Uh, here's another one. This one is alive. This one's just over 14 feet around. And this is another one over 9,000 board feet of wood in this tree at Cook Forest. So it's not just one big hemlock, it's several of them. Okay? Same tree. Okay? This right now, this is the current state champ hemlock. We call this the Susquehanna hemlock at Cook Forest. And this one's just under 14 feet uh, in girth at breast height and a little over, oh, about 135 feet high. And right now, this is the largest known hemlock in the state. It's also the largest known hemlock by volume anywhere in the Northeast United States, and a little over 11,000 board feet of wood in this tree. I mean, if some of you folks are familiar with board feet, maybe some uh, uh, timberman in here, and you know that you're likely gonna have to harvest acres of forest to even get 10,000 board feet of wood. Here we've got it in one tree. <coughs> Safe, uh, next. Safe tree. And Heart's Content. That's not too far from here. And uh, Heart's Content has some dandies as well. Uh, go ahead. Uh, this one is a co champ. In terms of numbers, depending on how you rate trees, these the, the big one at Cook Forest and the big one at Heart's Content are virtually identical. Okay, when you look at the girth, look at the height, look at the crown spread. But this tree is actually about 14 and a half feet around at breast height. The big one at Cook is not even 14 foot around. But the heights are different. But notice how the volume of wood changes. The big one at Cook is about 11,000. This one's about 7,500. But when we do the volume stuff, it's very fat down here, but it slenders up much quickly, or much quicker. The one at Cook Forest, it's fat down low, and it's still fat about 40 feet in the air. So there's a lot more wood. So there's a variety of different ways to measure bigness. But either way, uh, Heart's Content is the next best place to go in the Northeast, in my, my opinion, uh, besides Cook Forest, in terms of big hemlocks. And they're very old here. The hemlocks here are probably in the 350 year age class, if not older. Some of the uh, ANF folks may have some better numbers than that. They're every bit as old as the old ones we have at Cook Forest. I'm not sure if everybody, anybody really knows for sure exactly how old. A lot of these big trees, um, have a lot of rot inside down near the base, so it's very hard to get a good accurate rain count. So my oldest, when I core trees, right now my oldest cored hemlock is actually a fairly small hemlock, real tight rings. There's a lot of times the big ones, they've been there a while and they're gonna have a lot of rot. You're just never gonna know how old they are. Okay, next one, the same, uh, same tree again, kind of get an idea for scale. And right near here, there's another one that's almost identical in size. There's actually three in this area that are quite large, not too far off of the main trail. Okay, next one. Same tree. Uh, this is a, a, a very lightly, or, it's an area in Pennsylvania that most people never get to. This is Forest H. Dutlinger uh, natural area. This is a, a little west of State College, north of I-80. 
and uh, this is miserable to get to. You, you're looking at about 1,700 foot of vertical elevation to get to the hilltop, but it's like a mini cook forest up there, and it's absolutely a uh, beautiful area. There's some hemlocks in here that are pushing 13 foot around. Not as tall as Cook Forest, not as big as Cook Forest, but you get that same kind of feel. And uh, this is right on the edge of, I would say, the death zone of hemlock woolly adelgid as it's coming across uh, the state of Pennsylvania. Most old hemlock sites around State College and Eastern PA are toast unless they've treated them or are on their way out or are severely stressed by hemlock woolly adelgid, not just <coughs> that, but also the elongated hemlock scale. And this is right on the edge. And uh, but it is, in my opinion, it's totally treatable, um, but you're looking at some work to get to the site, but it is possible. Yes? They are, the District 15 is treating in Delaware. Are they? Yeah. That's um, great news. Yep. Cortex Good. and Safari. Good. And in various years, yeah, they, they're getting in there. That's great. The old the old section up here, it, I, the, the entire natural area is well over 100 acres, but the old section up here isn't 100 acres. Maybe you're looking at 10 to 15 acres. And uh, so that's great news that they're up there doing that. There's these little areas like this oftentimes we overlook. It's like, well, we don't have time, we don't have money, but we've already lost most of these types of small old growth ridgetop acreages in the central part of the state. And to see them uh, uh, take your notice and get into areas like this is really good news. Okay, next one. Uh, Meadville, how many think there's old growth forest in Meadville? Anybody been to Meadville? Several minutes, okay? I didn't think there was either, but you know, if you don't look, you don't know. But in this, uh, in, you go to the next one. There's a, a main cemetery, the old cemetery in Meadville. Back behind, and there, and behind the cemetery is a deep ravine, hemlock, beautiful hemlock covered forest, some little waterfalls. And so go to the next one. You've got a hemlock sheltered stream. And several of these hemlocks in here are fairly tall. They've got some hemlocks in here over 130 feet. Trying to find a hemlock stand over 130 feet in Pennsylvania is very hard to do. We've got a lot of forest. I don't think we've found 130 in Hearts Content, although we've got close. Um, but uh, there's very few hemlock sites that we know of in Western PA that uh, have hemlocks that go over 130 feet. This is one of them. And go to the next one. Uh, we've cored uh, uh, white oak and hemlock in here to the 250 pushing 300 year age class. That's a uh, old white oak on the left, and this is a hemlock here on the right. Next one. This is maybe about 20, 25 or so acres of uh, hemlock shielded stream. Most of that is old growth. This is a much smaller hemlock, but still about the same age class. We couldn't get maybe, I probably had a good four or five inches to get to the center. What we pulled out was about 225 rings. So it doesn't matter. One thing to remember is, you know, you got a big hemlock that's 300 years old. You might have a little hemlock that's 300 years old. It all depends where they're growing. Okay, next one. Wintergreen Gorge behind Penn State Barren up in Erie. Next one. Keep going. Uh, this is a very deep ravine. It's uh, about 225 feet vertical feet to the bottom, and around the edge of this ridge are mm -hmm. lots of small stature old hemlock forests. Keep going. Kind of looking down in there. Next one. Next one. And it's the stream as it wraps around, it cuts through uh, a very deep shale layer. Next one. And so the ground up here is very shallow. Uh, uh, this is my little tree measure, buddy. She goes with me everywhere I go. But we've got <laughs> dwarf stature hemlock forest all over the top. And yeah, this is kind of neat. These are wave ripple marks about 200, <coughs> all about 300 vertical feet above Lake Erie. So the water was actually higher than what it is now. So, but it's a very neat area. Go to the next one. Yeah, but these dwarf stature hemlocks are, we've quoted several up here in the 225 age class, which predates the lumber history for that area, which probably would have started in the about 18, early 1800s, before 1820s most likely. And what a lot of the bottom of this ravine in the easier accessible areas have decent sized hemlock, but those are second growth. But on these steep ravines and fingers going down into the valley, they were small 200, 150, 175 years ago, and they're still small now. Okay, next one. Here's one, another one that we cored in 225. Not very big. Next one. Uh, this one is uh, uh, another, this is a really old one. This one surprised me. It's about 360 years. Uh, back there. We probably cataloged a little over 20 acres of old growth at uh, behind Penn State Barren. 
but it was kind of neat is when you go into these areas, I'm hearing the same bird species that are predominant, be it Cook Forest, be it Hearts Content, Tynus, the scenic area. I mean, you'll hear ravens, I mean, which is kind of neat when you're back into the wilderness area. I'll hear the different kinds of warblers, the black burnians, the black throated green warblers. And uh, so it's like you're transported back to these different places. So whether it's a, a large diameter hemlock forest or small diameter forest, they're still performing the same ecological functions, okay? So it uh, doesn't matter if you have an old forest or a young forest, they still are very special, especially for the ecological significance. Okay, next one. Uh, there are a variety of uh, threats and pests to hemlock forests. Uh, some of these are native, others maybe non-native. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of these. Some of you are going to be maybe fairly familiar with the looper or the hemlock borer. Uh, needle rust is a type of a fungus. Uh, spruce spider mites can be a pain, but they really don't often kill them. But you put all of these together that are feeding off of these in a variety of ways, it's one more stress you know, uh, layer that gets on there. And after a while, they're going to not be able to cope with the stress. One of the bad ones up here, the worst one up here though, is this elongated hemlock scale. Um, that's all over around the uh, state college area. And if that gets up here, we're gonna have serious problems because it's very expensive to treat this critter. You can't treat it a cheap way when you have hemlock really delgent and this one in the same stand. You have to use the more expensive chemical, which works good. Uh, but it's uh, it's probably about 10 times more expensive than imidacloprid, which is generally the way we prefer to treat a couple of really dead. Okay, next one. This is the one that we're here to learn about, which is uh, hemlock woolly delgin. I'm not going to go too in depth on uh, the biology and all that. Tim is uh, much well, much more well versed on uh, hemlock woolly delgin biology and identification than I am. And um, but if you look, these are the main. This is mainly what you're looking for. When you're going out in the woods, you want to flip the hemlock branches upside down and look underneath. When it's really moderately to maybe heavy, heavily infested, you may not have to flip the branch over. You just see this white looks like snow or little snowballs. But these are this is taken probably in uh, early spring, late winter, where these insects are just full of eggs. Uh, but you see those white snowballs on your hemlock tree. Chances are you get hemlock woolly adelgid. There are some possible look-alikes, but once you can pick this up, there's not much else that you can mistake this for. Okay, all right, next one. Uh, just a brief look at some of the big hemlock trees uh, across the eastern United States and uh, kind of get you an idea. It doesn't matter how big or how little your hemlock tree is, it can still be put out by this little tiny bug that often you can't even see the adult unless you've got a hand lens. Okay. This is the Caldwell Giant. This is the largest known hemlock, eastern hemlock ever documented down the Great Smokies. If you've ever been to the Smokies, if you haven't been there in the last 10 years, uh, you're going to be uh, very disappointed next time you go down there because what they haven't treated, if anything that they haven't treated is very stressed, if not gone. And uh, this is a monster. Looking at our big ones, our biggest one at Cook Forest is about 11,500 board feet. The largest one is 19,000 board feet of wood. Single stem, 19 feet around. We've got doubles and triples in the park that are gonna push that. But a single stem hemlock, that's absolutely massive, okay? This is now, this died because of hemlock really don't, okay? <coughs> Next one. This is another monster. This was the tallest known hemlock ever documented in the eastern US. This one went over 170 feet, 173 feet. We had pines. We only have a couple of pines, three pines that Cook Forest that make it to 170. And uh, Cook Forest is known for its tall pine. But in terms of hemlock uh, and pine, Smokies just blow us away. But hemlock woolly adulted uh, has taken this one out as well. Another 18,000 board feet of wood, over 15 and a half foot single step tree. Absolutely massive. And uh, this fellow here is Will Blozan. He, uh, he's the president of the uh, Native Tree Society as an old arborist company down south and has done much of the research work down south in terms of documenting these last remaining big old hemlock trees. Okay, next one. This is a success story. This is currently the tallest and the largest known hemlock anywhere in the eastern United States. This was 16 foot around, almost 160 foot high, and you're looking at almost 19,000 board feet of wood in this tree. Uh, this they hit with safari and a minute cloprid 
and uh, but if you were to look at the forest around it, the rest of the forest is toast. Uh, but they were able to save this one. Next one. This is a huge trunk. Of this. this is the same tree. It's a multi-trunk tree. Once you get up, probably over 80 feet or so, it starts to break into different large branches. So very complex crown. Next one. This is what the this is what looks like if you don't treat the forest, okay, for years and years. <coughs> all this gray stuff is all dead hemlocks. This isn't you know. This, the green is deciduous trees, okay? This isn't taken in the spring where you might be thinking, well, there's no leaves on the deciduous tree. Uh, this is taken late spring where the tree, other trees have leafed out already, but gray ghosts. We don't want this to happen here in Western Pennsylvania, okay? So uh, we're gonna flip through a couple more here. Uh, keep going. This is Snyder Middle Swarf, keep going. This is uh, just west of, or just east of State College. This was the next best place to go in the Northeast to see tall hemlocks besides Cook Forest. And this was hit hard by hemlock really indulgent and likely the elongate hemlock scale. They did treat some trees uh, for hemlock really indulgent back in the mid, I'll say 2005 or three time frame. Uh, but here, this you can see this was a hemlock shouldered stream. You had all the moss going down through here. Uh, this was just 99% of the trees were hemlock forest. All of this is gone, so just go through some of these. Next one. Just to kind of give you an idea, this was all hemlock dominated forest. We don't want this to be cooked forest. We don't want this to be the tie to scenic area, okay? Or maybe a <coughs> private hemlock stand that you may have a couple of some private property which may have over a thousand acres of this kind of stuff. Next. Okay. Here's one that they did treat that was still alive. So um, that's probably about it. Let me see the next one. Okay. Uh, I think I'm going to stop it here, and uh, we're starting to go into some of the areas that we found it around here. But I'm going to let uh, Tim talk a little bit more, get more in depth on the biology. So if you want to <coughs> introduce uh, Tim, anybody have any questions for me before we move to uh, Tim? <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to talk about biology and <coughs> identification of the insect that we're here to talk about, which is the hem hemlock lily adelgid. And one of the questions that people are always asking me is, what is this, what is this adelgid word in this name? So, the, uh, so just to explain that real quick, the adelgid is actually a family of insects. So it's a big group of insects that are closely related. And that family is called the adelgidae. I don't actually know, the, I should figure out what the roots of that is, because uh, I don't actually know. But um, so these are, in a group of the true bugs, which means, and in this group, you have things that don't have a pupa, pupal stage or whatever, they have simple metamorphosis, which basically means, um, by simple metamorphosis, we mean that they kind of, from the time they leave the egg to the time that they're an adult, they basically have a very, the same lifestyle. They basically feed on the same things and they grow and grow and get bigger and they molt. Um, unlike, if you could think of like a fly or a, or a butterfly, they have this a larval stage with a caterpillar, and then there is a pupal stage, and then there's an adult that has wings, and in many cases with insects, that larvae and the adult with insects that have a pupal stage will do completely different things as, <coughs> as larvae than they do from adults. If, if, again, if you think about a, what a, how a caterpillar eats versus um, a butterfly, they're quite different. But in the case of these adelgidae and other things that, that are related, like um, uh, aphids and things like that are closely related, they just kind of have this little insect that gets bigger over time. So that's called simple metamorphosis. Um, they have a piercing, sucking mouth parts, which in, and I'll show you that in a minute, but it's basically they have this big, long proboscis that they stick in and feed in the plant. Um, so, and in the case of the adelgids, they feed exclusively on evergreens. And uh, most of them have a complex life cycle with t two different hosts. And um, what that means is that unlike what you think, whenever I was always into biology, I think everything is like vertebrates, basically. You have this thing that has a childhood and adulthood and it just goes up and then it has, as an adult, it has offspring and it's basically a circular life cycle. But in the case of adelgidae and a lot of things, actually, probably more things than our vertebrates, 
they actually have these weird life cycles that in the case of Adelgid, it's actually like a figure eight. And the Adelgidae, this is where it starts to get a little bit weird, actually mostly diversified on spruce. So we're here to talk about hemlock tonight, but the whole, all of the diversification actually happened on spruce. And in the, in the case here with the hemlock, the hemlock is actually the secondary host. And another example <coughs> is in these pictures. This is the pine bark adelgid, which some of you may be familiar with, um, um, where it, it'll have these big outbreaks on the trunks, where the whole trunk is whitewashed with these little things. And it's, <coughs> that's, uh, in that case, so another weird case where through evolution, it's actually lost its original host and it only exists on the white pine. Whatever it diversified on, whatever spruce is long gone, and it no longer has that part of its life cycle, which is kind of interesting. And um, so here in this, normally we would only have eight native adelgids, but with all these different introduced insects that have taken place, there's actually 16 species now. I'm not, not sure what all those different species are, but I know a handful of them. And uh, so I know the one native is pine bark adelgid, and the one that we're here to talk about tonight is uh, the hemlock woolly adelgid. There's also an, the balsam woolly adelgid, some of you might know. It's a problem for Christmas tree growers and balsam forests. Uh, so anyways, that's just a quick introduction to the family adelgid. So some of that word might make more sense. Um, next slide, please. So this is what we're here to talk about. Like we've already seen these little white um, blobs that occur on the underside of the branches and it's always like Dale said if you want to know if you have it it's always best to flip that branch up um, to look at the underside because sometimes especially like at this time of the year they're still pretty small and I'll talk about the life cycle for this insect but right now at this time of the year it's hard to see so you have to flip it up um, now the next can I see the next slide uh, this is this is a shot from above, but this is a pretty heavy infestation. And you, you can see it from above. Today, <laughs> and you could actually see them from the above, but again, it was a fairly heavy infestation. And a lot of times, if you only have a hand, few on a branch, it's really good, always good to flip the branch over and look from the other side. Uh, next slide. So this is actually um, what they look like. If you pull away all that wool, this is what's underneath, and this is actually the stage that they, that the, the form they're in when they go through the summer. So um, I'll talk about the life cycle in a second, and I'll show you a picture of it, but they're actually a weird insect in that they actually have their quiet hibernation period in the summer, and this is what they look like during that stage. So if it's, say, late July, August, early September, and you happen to be in some hemlock forest that you might not get back to, this is what you might want to look for. But to see this, probably most of us in this room, if you have really good eyes, you need to have some form of magnification to see this. Um, and eventually, if you get used to it, you can sometimes see it without magnification. But they're quite small, about the size of a pepper grain. And you'll notice, and I'll show you more pictures of this, that they're usually down here around the base of the needle. Um, and in a heavy infestation, you would see, you can see three and four all like around the base of a single needle. But usually it's only one, but it can get up to really high numbers. And um, <coughs> that's when you'll start seeing tons of wool and really heavy impact on the trees. Um, okay, next, next slide. So this is, um, after, one of the other weird things about this group that I forgot to mention is that this is an insect that doesn't move except for when it hatches out of the egg. So it hatches, it crawls, and it's got a stage called the crawler where it moves, and it goes and finds a suitable feeding site, and then it stays there for the rest of its life. So this is a crawler that's actually found a place to spend the rest of its life, which is here on the base of the needle, and this structure, this is a, you know, a magnified image, obviously. And this is the needle over here, and this is the stem. And so here we have the little insect, and these little things here, that's one of its antennae. 
and it's already starting to produce a little wool here. But what I wanted to show you here is where it feeds. This layer here is actually the abscission layer, which is where the needle will eventually fall off of the tree once it gets old enough. Um, just like leaves fall off, there's actually a layer there of cells where the leaves separate from the tree. And that's where it actually feeds is, well, I'll show you it will be clear in the next slide, but it feeds just below that layer. So can, can we see the next slide? And this is another one. He's a little bit smashed, but this long stringy thing here is, uh, that's the, um, the long proboscis that it has. And this again is the needle over here, and that's the main stem. That's the needle going out. And see if, if you look, he's, this thing is going down here and going into the plant. That's because it feeds below that abscission layer on um, um, cells inside of there uh, called the ray parenchyma cells. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is that one was still a young nymph. This is now an adult, magnified, and uh, there you can see its big, long proboscis. So, in order for these, you know, the, the way insects grow is that they actually have to molt over time. So, in order for them to molt, they also have to pull that the proboscis out of the tree, and it molts too. And in this case, um, the preparation for making the scanning electron microscope thing, the, uh, a lot of times when insects dry, that little mouth part will come apart because they're actually composed of four separate uh, pieces. If you think, so all insects have the same mouth parts but in different shapes. So if you think of whenever you've seen a, you've picked up a grasshopper and seen all those little moving mouth parts, these are the same parts but modified into a different shape and then they stick together into this sucking tube that they stick down into the, to the, to the uh, in this case, the hemlock, which is pretty cool. Uh, and notice also that what's cool is that they still have their legs, even though they never use these legs as after the crawling stage, but they're still there. The other thing that's neat is these, if you look, I don't know how well you can see from the back, but along the back here, the, these are all the pores where that wool will be exuded. And if I could have the next slide, this is actually a really close-up shot of that wool starting to come out. Um, this was all, these pictures were all from a graduate student uh, at North Carolina State. But this always reminds me of this uh, Play-Doh toy that I had as a kid when you, you stuck the blob <laughs> in there and squeezed it out and it oozes out. So and I haven't really talked much about this, but the wool, um, you'll often see these pictures where it's, they refer to it as the Ovisac, and Dale talked about that, and that's because late um, about the early part of March they start um, laying eggs and the eggs are laid into that wool um, but it also functions as a protection for the insect too because nothing likes to have that wooly stuff all over them except for uh, one thing that I'll show you later. Uh, so this is a quick version of the life history in, in the picture form so the adults are that form there and then inside of these if you peel these open with get under a microscope and use some needles to tease it apart you see the little eggs inside there they're little kind of purplish red little you know round things and uh, so let's see how, do you, how does this go oh here's the these are the crawlers that hatch out down here these are pretty hard to see and this is the stage in which they move and one of the ways that they move is an entomologist comes in to look for these things and they get them all over. Well, I had them on me in the spring. They're quite difficult to see. They're very tiny, but you can, if you look closely, you'll see them crawling around on you. And then those, that's first instar, and then that the stage that goes through the summer, or I'll show you in the next uh, slide. Um, there's two, they actually have two generations a year. And there's two times of the year when they look like this, which is just this little black peppery thing with a white halo around it. And then that feeds and eventually comes back to the adult. Um, <coughs> can I the next slide? And this is just a picture of it. That's where they've been teased open. And you can see the, um, those are what the eggs look like inside. And so this is what, it starts to get a little confusing if you don't, think about that whole life cycle. So you, most of these insects, they're all female, um, what we have here. So, but they produce, and most of them are wingless, but there is this stage where they produce a winged form 
and it goes off to look for spruce. But uh, luckily we don't have the spruce that it needs here. So this is what that wing form looks like, and that's produced in the spring. And if they did, well, I'll talk about it in a second, but there's, and, um, each one can lay, you can see, 10 to 300 eggs. So you can see, because they're all female, one of the problems that you have is that it only takes a single insect to start a whole new infestation. So it's a very difficult insect to deal with. It's possible. Uh, so that's a big downside of this insect. Uh, let's see. <coughs> Next slide, please. So this is just a, a you know an artist's representation of that life cycle. You can see the, the two different colors represent the two different generations a year. Where are we at now? We're here in November, so they're just they've come through their estivation. They're starting to feed now. They're turning white, and then those will feed all the way through the winter. The hemlock, the tree itself, is active through the winter, and this insect is active through the winter, feeding, uh, and then it produces these eggs that hatch um, in late March, and that's one of the stages in which uh, they can be moved around, and then there's this quick generation. So this generation in the spring, most of them go on to produce eggs and keep that thing going. But you also do have this weird subset of those that will produce a wing form and go off and look for spruce. Um, what they are looking for is uh, tiger tail spruce, um, which was the alternate host in the part of Japan where these, uh, these guys came from. Uh, so, next slide. Oh, and this is, this is actually what they would produce. I just put this in because I get kind of crazy, but this is to make it interesting. This is what they would produce on uh, spruce. This is a spruce branch, and if this was Japan or Asia, um, they would produce this. There is a group of people actually out looking because there's a, about 40 places in the United States uh, uh, where tiger tail spruce is planted right next to infested hemlock. So, but as, as last I heard, they had yet to find one of these uh, galls. This is an actual gall that they produce. Um, but that so far, no one has ever seen this in the United States, even where you would expect to see it. But that could be interesting if that ever happens. Uh, but that's just there. To show you. Uh, next slide. So this is actually, this is a picture of um, where all the different species of spruce are at. So it, what's interesting, here's our Tsuga canadensis is our eastern uh, hemlock. And then you have this other second species which is down in western Virginia called the Carolina hemlock. But what's interesting to me is that never occurred to me that the actual diversity of hemlock is mostly in Asia, but also going all the way around the Pacific Rim. So the weird thing, the weirdest thing of all, is that the eastern hemlock is distantly related to all those other species. The Carolina hemlock is more closely related to those Asian species than it is to ours. And there's uh, one of the ways that we know that that's true, in addition to genetics and boring stuff, is that you can, uh, you can actually get the Carolina hemlock to cross with those species, or to hybridize. <coughs> this is important when we're trying to, you know, probably a lot of you are aware that they've tried to produce these resistant chestnut trees, for example, by breeding with Chinese chestnut. They haven't been able to do that with the eastern hemlock. Um, they haven't been able to get them to hybridize. So, but the other thing I wanted to show you is that this T. Uh, Suga siboldii is the hemlock from which our um, the uh, it, the hemlock woolly delgid that is infesting eastern hemlock comes from. All of these around the Pacific Rim have hemlock woolly delgid, or what we're calling hemlock woolly delgid, because there's some evidence that they might be uh, separate species. Um, one line of that evidence is that this, if you ever Google this thing, sometimes you'll find these uh, references to um, hemlock woolly delgid coming into the United States in the 20s, and that was because somebody found it on this western hemlock, but that's actually, it was always there. And one way that we know that is that it does not produce, just like the pine bark delgid does not produce a generation looking for spruce, this one over here, the, the HWA here, 
does not produce um, a spruce generation, a big spruce generation. Uh, I think that's all I wanted to say there. Uh, next slide, please. So, so, like I said, the one that's here is native to, Hemlock woolly adelgid is native all over Asia and Japan, and the one here is from Japan, and it probably came in in the 50s, but somebody wanted to, needed to have really bad a um, Tsuga sigoldii for their garden, probably in the Richmond area. Um, so it was brought in by a private plant collector, basically. Um, and it kind of bubbled around down there for a long time, and then I, uh, that it, all of a sudden there was this big outbreak. And it's now, at this point, it's in 19 different states. So stretching from the bottom of Maine all the way down into Georgia. And I, uh, I think the main place it's west into is Ohio. They have found it in Michigan, but I think they eradicated those populations. So I haven't heard anything about them in a while. Um, they were quite small. Uh, and so the next slide. This is where it's at in Pennsylvania, or at least where we know that it's at. Um, uh, Armstrong was just found uh, last uh, last spring down just north of Apollo on some trees on the side of the road. Um, and we do do a surveys every year trying to find if there's more that's spreading into the, these gray counties that haven't been found yet. Um, so and every year we go out and look and see if we have found it. Um, and then those kind of brownish counties are the most recent finds before that. But um, one interesting thing is so usually you see counties added every year, but those couple years of cold winters, there was a, a skip, I think 2014, we didn't find any. So that was, I'll talk more about the cold weather stuff. But uh, next slide. So how do they move around? Um, let's remember it's during that short period after they hatch the eggs when they can move. So and what I always tell people is they basically get any way that they can, because you'll see these studies that say, well, they're definitely doing this, and here's a study that says they're definitely doing this. But they move on people and on animals and on the wind, and basically however they need to get there. Which is interesting is that if you're actually trying to infest trees, it's actually quite difficult. <laughs> so I don't know what, 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 why that is, but uh, so, but lots of different things moving around. Um, and it's a good idea, especially if people who are volunteering to do those surveys, to keep that in mind. If you're gonna go to an area where it's never been seen, you probably wanna do that first thing in the morning before going somewhere where it's known to be at. Um, and then you're accidentally spreading it, because it is quite easy. And, um, Try to be careful because I, I wouldn't be surprised if I moved it. I've caught myself with the crawlers on me many times, so it's it's much easier to do than you think. Um, next slide, please. So, so this is just a list of the reasons why this thing is so difficult. You know, they don't have the problem of, of low populations, like of trying to find a mate because they don't need a mate. They're all females. Um, they do have natural enemies, but they're pretty restricted, and the, these things produce so many eggs, and they're so prolific that none of the ones that are here have so far been able to control them. Um, there is some host defense, but uh, that's not fully understood. I mean, I've, and it's, I can say that to the extent that I've been in areas where the hemlock, where the hemlock woolly adelgid has been there for a decade, and there's these patches that look just like the pictures Dale showed you where there's you can just for miles you can see these dead trees but then there that's surrounding these nice uh, beautiful patches of completely healthy hemlock where for whatever reason the conditions must be very good and there's no uh, death going on. Um, the other thing is in very young hemlock will often show some resistance but once the infestation gets up high enough it usually breaks down and I think in those cases where they look, where you see those patches of very healthy ones for years, and I think that once the population probably gets up high enough, that will also happen. Um, the area that it's in my head right now, it gets very cold winters, so it's probably a combination of cold and good conditions. Um, the climate issue is, has to do with 
um, areas of like last year, areas here, like in Cook Forest where it got really cold and um, just wipes it out for a while. But it usually comes back eventually, like in winters, like we're expecting this year. Uh, and that contiguous host range is just allowing it to move across, especially if you look at that that range map that I showed, it's up and down the Appalachians where the populations are quite thick. So, um, next slide, please. Oh, and here's the winter temperature. So you'll see, like, last year, these really cold temperatures do help. Um, and last year, what Dale was saying, that they were seeing negative 25 and even colder than that, I think, in the forest. So we were finding where we could find a delta in there, we were seeing 100% mortality. We saw that outside of the Emporium. There were other areas where you would think it would be pretty cold, like uh, Wyckoff Run. There was only, we only must stay warmer in there because we only saw 50% mortality. So, so the cold is a factor, but also another thing that helped last year is that a lot of that cold was fairly late. So the closer they get to the March, when they're on a bus beat, this is speculation on my part, but I assume something physiological related to that egg laying period where they're less able to withstand that cold. Or maybe they're getting up in mass. I don't know what it is, but for some reason it's been shown that the later that really cold weather happens, the more higher the mortality is. Um, and you have to kill more than 90% of the population to really knock it off. So if you're not, if you only have 50% mortality, you can go into Wyckoff right now and find a Delgin pretty much everywhere you want. So um, that obviously didn't get cold enough to get it below 90% or to kill more than 90%. So, so what always makes me nervous when you have a cold winter is that everybody think gets sort of complacent and thinks, oh, it's all dead. Well, it's probably not dead. And as soon as we have a nice warm winter like this one, it'll probably be back in full force. <coughs> so next slide, please. Um, so this is just basically the way it kills the trees. It's, so it's feeding on those brave parenchyma cells. So this is, it's, there's some caveats to this. It feeds on those cells. It's probably draining the reserve of the tree, causing needles to fall off and buds to die. And you'll see in some cases the branches start to die from the bottom up and end up with these kind of thicker tops. But you'll notice in those that usually there's still some life in those bottom branches for a long time. And in fact, it usually takes you know five to 20 years and you'll see these trees lingering for a long time. Um, a positive of that is that there's a long time with hemlock that you can treat them and they will still recover. So it's pretty amazing to see those trees that look really bad you, you treat them with some of these chemicals and they come back and look like a very flush, full tree again. So they can recover in ways like, that's not the case with ash, but there's reasons for that. But you can, an ash that looks bad, is trying to treat it and it, you know, with has EAB, um, that won't, won't get the same recovery. One caveat to this is, um, that the way that the hemlock actually dies is that it, in the end, is that they die from water stress. So uh, the xylem that transports the fluids inside the tree actually become inefficient at moving those fluids, and so they die um, from the stress. So the question is, um, you, know, you remember I showed you that picture of the gall on the spruce? So obviously this insect is capable of producing chemicals that can change the growth of the tree. So is, is the change in the xylem cells, is it a reaction of the tree to stress, or is the insect injecting something into that tree that causes the xylem to grow in an inefficient shape? That we don't actually know the answer to, um, but if people are looking at that, then if you have to sit through this again, maybe I'll have an answer next year or something like that. <laughs> but okay, next slide. Oh, well, this is towards the end. This is, um, we don't, I don't always see this everywhere, but in, it does seem to be in warmer, drier areas. Um, I've seen this down around Harrisburg uh, at Fort Indian Town Gap. And, um, well, this won't matter, but down in southern West Virginia. This is, what happens is Dale showed that one insect called the hemlock borer. It's a beetle uh, related to emerald ash borer. 
and it's native. <coughs> it's always there at low numbers, but when the tree is very stressed and has its defenses are down, uh, the beetle will move in at high numbers, and then uh, so it's in there under the bark. And just like you may have noticed with the emerald ash borer, the woodpeckers come in to eat that beetle, and they rip all the bark off the uh, the tree. And it, underneath the outer gray bark, it's hemlock or sometimes it's red color. Um, this one is pretty stark. I've seen a few like that in Cook Forest where they're more of an orange color. Um, but sometimes it's not it's not as distinguishable like. Um, ash has that kind of late light color when you see this happening but uh, so sometimes it's hard to see on hemlock but uh, if you have a hemlock in that condition it's it's toast it's because it's uh, never going to recover there's the beetles have eaten all of the, um, the flow of under the bark so there's nothing left to recover uh, next slide so I have no idea. Uh, well, so just I was going to talk about some of the ways of trying to deal with this. Um, and I'm just going to go through these real quick. Uh, and if you guys have questions, you can either ask them at the end or you can get a hold of me. So the breeding and genetic conversation, Dale hinted at this. There are, um, uh, the cones are being collected and sent off for not only for being grown in South America, but some of them are also going into those seed vaults that people have heard about. And then some are grown for these hybridization experiments. And so, uh, and like I was saying, they're trying to do these different breeding things. But along with that, um, there are places where they have found trees that they think are resistant. So the big famous one uh, is a stand in New Jersey that they've been tracking for close to 15 years. Um, it actually gets regularly infested with adelgid, but then they die off, I believe, over the summer. And um, some seedlings, I think, from there and from other places that where they've also been tested for resistance that were just planted about a month ago up in, um, well, District 15, are we in District 15? For the District 15 of the Pennsylvania Bureau of Forestry, but uh, they, so some of these have been planted and are being tested in Pennsylvania right now. So that's an area of hope because um, there does seem to be strong evidence of resistance in this case. The downside would be that these are from a single stand and probably have pretty low genetic diversity. And I think that they have shown no resistance to that elongate hemlock scale that I'm aware of. I think it's just a delta, but that's something. Um, so, okay, but I'll just talk about chemical control. Can I have the next slide? So, I'm going to just talk about these different methods, and what I'm not going to talk about are, you know, that anytime you were to use any of these, you should always follow the label <laughs> and wear the appropriate protective gear. Because, for one thing, people go crazy with these labels and they think, well, they say to use this much, it'll probably make a, uh, sense to use 30 times as much. But actually, with most of these chemicals, if you do that, you actually cause other problems. Uh, Dale showed that uh, the spider mite, and you, if you use too much of some of these chemicals, you'll get spider mite outbreaks, and then you have another problem. So just make sure you follow the label. Uh, okay, uh, next slide. So the first one is just these insecticidal soaps and sprays, and these are not toxic. They, uh, in the sense that they kill by smothering the insect. And this is just a picture of somebody who tried to do it on like on an industrial scale um, with a huge sprayer. But you can just get a regular um, backpack sprayer and spray this stuff. But uh, the downside is it's really only you have to coat all of these adelgid. So you have to be able to reach the whole tree. So it's usually only effective on smaller trees. Um, so and in fact, down in the Smokies, they actually tried this method with huge uh, industrial spray trucks and things and found it to not be effective uh, you know, for really huge stands of trees. Um, but I have talked to people that use this method. If you have trees small that are relatively small, um, it, does, it does work. Um, next slide. So the soil dredge, now this would be used uh, with these, if you go to Lowe's or whatever your local garden center and you buy those, the aminocloprid, which is a neonicotinoid insecticide. This is usually the way they work. You mix a little bit with water, 
the amount is based on the, uh, the size of the tree trunk, and then we pour it around the base. Um, now, one of the other things that uh, I bet people are paying attention to the news and such is neonicotinoids are kind of a controversial group of chemicals, so you want to be very careful with using them. Um, that's the thing that people are worried is killing the bees. So you wouldn't want to use that if you were, if a bunch of these that I'm going to talk about are in this group. But you would, so you wouldn't want to use it if this was in your yard and you had a big giant flowering plant right underneath it. Um, but an upside is that hemlock trees are uh, not pollinated by bees, so it's safe if you're using it just on the hemlock itself. Uh, so that's the dredge, just a quick version of the dredge method. Uh, next slide. Um, this, was, this is using the same chemical, imidacloprid, <coughs> but on a larger scale. You can get these uh, injectors. Um, there's two different forms. This is the one that's easily available right now. It's basically you mix it up into these tanks. This is the tank on this one, and then you inject it below the soil level around the base of the tree where the, the feeder roots there around the base of the tree. And uh, that's the way this one works. This is a uh, very popular method if you're treating large numbers of trees because there's a couple different forms, or actually there's many different forms of these chemicals, that's why I can't have no time to go through it all right now, but this is the probably the cheapest and fastest method of doing large numbers of trees. Uh, next slide. This method is still a metacloprid, uh, but in this case, you actually put a plug into the base of the tree, it's a little plastic plug, goes into the xylem cells and you actually, you, it's pressurized by a, there's a couple different forms. This one is with a bike pump, um, but it's actually, even though you're pressurizing it, it's still the tree actually pulls this chemical up. So you shoot it in and it's just like an IV kind of, because an IV will just sit there if you're dead. So the same way with the tree. If the tree is not pulling up the fluids, it won't pull this out of the bottle no matter how much you pump that bike pump. Uh, so it's pretty cool, actually, if you're, if you're really into biology, because you can actually see the tree doing different things. You can tell when the stomates open on the top of that tree that there's, and it's photosynthesizing. It's pretty, it's very exciting. Uh, <laughs> um, so that, that's pretty cool. And, but this is used where you're close to water. So uh, with the open water, in this case, it was a high water table. So because the, the imidacloprid is another thing that you want to be very careful of, is not getting into open water. It's an insecticide. So um, and we're trying to protect trout streams in a lot of cases. So if you blast a bunch of imidacloprid into the stream and you kill all of the aquatic invertebrates that Dale was talking about, you pretty much still wiped out the trout for a problem. So that's what this is used for. Uh, next slide. Um, Another method is uh, that where this is for um, elongate hemlock scale, especially is the, these bark sprays where you spray the base of the tree up to about four and a half feet. Um, and what uh, this is no, no longer a midacloprid, but it is still a neonicotinoid. It's called a dinotetran. Um, and what Dale was saying is that it's it's very expensive and it actually also lasts only about a year whereas the other methods we were talking about last well according to the label they last about four years but there's research that shows it probably it lasts up to twice that long whereas this one there's tons of research that says it only lasts a year and uh, it's extremely expensive so but the bark spray and it's just applied with a regular old sprayer uh, <coughs> next, next slide, please. So, and then the other thing I want to talk about is these biological controls. There's a, a bunch of different things that have been used over the years. This work has been going on since the, the 90s. Um, a bunch of different beetles have been released. A mite has been looked at, and um, there is um, a fly, actually, that's been being looked at. It's the fly is native to the west coast, but there are relatives of that fly in this area. And actually, um, if you remember that I said that we know that that hemlock woolly adelgid was native to the west coast, another second line of evidence for that was actually that there is a beetle, a predator beetle on the west coast that had been was out there feeding on HWA, and 
um, you couldn't. And it's a species all in, you know that doesn't exist anywhere else. So if HWA wasn't native out there, you wouldn't have a species of beetle that didn't exist anywhere else feeding on it out there. Uh, can I have the next slide? This is very exciting because this is actually right before Jim and I came here today. We were out releasing one of these, some of these beetles. Uh, in the Wyckoff Run area, we released a thousand beetles. Um, and here they are, these little black things. They're a little hard to see. I was just went for the best one I could find. This is actually Laracobius osakensis, so it is not native to the west coast. You might guess from that name. It is uh, native to the same place in Japan where the where the Adelgid is from. So I can guess that it's many of you are thinking right now that this will be the next thing that comes in swarms and lives in the fall and gets into your house <laughs> like the uh, but actually just like the Adelgid is active in the winter, this beetle is also active in the winter. That's why we're releasing it right now. Because it will stay active as an adult feeding only on Adelgid. It cannot produce eggs unless it feeds on Adelgid. And so it's active through the winter, out eating. And then when it's not active, so those ladybugs that come in in the winter are actually trying to find a place to hibernate. This thing actually in the summer, um, it pupates. It's, uh, it has larvae in the spring, and then it pupates in the soil over the summer, and then it emerges in the fall. So I'm relatively certain that this one will never get into your house. <laughs> <laughs> Because if, if there's no reason why it would. Um, it's also quite tiny, so even if it did, you probably wouldn't notice. Uh, anyways, that was a hot off the press picture, so I couldn't resist uh, showing it tonight. Um, this one, um, this Osakensis, eats more adelgid, and it lays more eggs, and is active at colder temperatures than is the one from the West Coast. That's why they're releasing this now instead. Um, is it expensive? Yes. Thank you for your tax dollars. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, the Forest Service funds it, and it is um, it's not coming, so it's not. Uh, Forest Service funds all the work to produce this beetle. Uh, they sent, so the way it works is somebody went over to Japan several years ago. Then um, they sent them to a lab at Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech then rears them out, and then we get the offspring. So this. Um, there are ways to get the, the native one to the United States. There, if you, there, there's consultants. Like if somebody was interested in that, I could put you in touch with him. That might be able to get you the one from the West Coast to release. Uh, but it is very expensive. The only people I've ever known that did that on a private, like private people that did that, were uh, was a big golf course in North Carolina. So we used to hire this guy. But it is possible to do. Um, the releases that we've done of those are. Oh, well, a lot of, uh, well, the one today was at Wyckoff Run, and then we released some at Cinema Honing. So hopefully what will happen over time is that they spread. So, but it does take them a while to build up in population. So, what's, I forget what the next slide is, but that might bring me to my next topic, which is what we're trying to, this is kind of one of those reminder slides. So what we've been trying to do is, so if you have trees you wanted to save, what I would recommend that you did before, because it's going to be a while for these beetles spread around, is treat the trees chemically. So, and what's research that's been going on, and that's what this illustrates, um, at Virginia Tech, what they've been trying to test to see whether it works is, can we go into an area, chemically treat all the big trees that everybody wants to save, and then release these beetles on the smaller trees that are, you know, not maybe not quite as valuable. And so this has been shown to be successful um, to the extent that, they, that the beetles can increase in population and as the chemical wears off in the trees, um, they're moving up into the trees and they're not being killed off by these chemicals. Because somehow, the, um, I don't know the exact mechanism for this, but the beetles know not to eat these uh, adelgid that have eaten the insecticide. Uh, so that's a a method of you know integrating these different methods to try to come up with a solution so it's not the best thing in the world but it's one thing that uh, people are looking at uh, but i think this is this is an image i used but i think it's actually from <coughs> kentucky they tested this in three places all none of them were in pennsylvania i think it was 
Kentucky, West Virginia, and Tennessee. So, uh, next slide. Okay, I think that was it. I probably got out of my time. And this is just a couple different resources, or um, this is me. If you want to contact me, if you have questions on any of this stuff, or I don't know if there's going to be more. Does anybody have any questions right now on any of that? So we're ejecting this in the soil. Yes. Um, and, and that's fine for a hillside and cook forest, but when I've got a well, well on my property, am I going to have two-headed babies? Yeah, I don't know if you'll have two-headed babies, but if it's right next to a well, I wouldn't use that method. I would either use the injection, injecting into the trunk, okay. or the bark. bark spray, potentially. Um, the other thing is if, it, if your well was very far from the trees, this and you have a lot of work if you have soil with a lot of organic matter in it, this does not generally move very far in the soil as long as it has, as if there's carbon for it to bind with. Okay. If you have really sandy soil, no, I wouldn't use that method. Um, Are these prophylactic methods or do you wait until you've got it? Uh, well, you, you can't, I would and probably, I mean, you can wait until you have it because it takes long enough, a long time to kill the tree, and the tree will recover. So, if I was, you know, I wouldn't know it. When I, w I used to work for West Virginia, and when I was down there, I didn't say that because a lot of places down there were much warmer, and the infestation moves much quicker and can kill the trees faster. But up here, you should have a long time in between seeing it and treating the tree. So up here, I probably would have wait until I see it, you know, or you know, if your neighbor has it, or something like that. But you can know it's in the area. Um, and I thought the what is the closest up here is like in the Warren area, correct? Where? Where are we? This isn't one of my counties, so I'm not sure yeah. where it's at right here. It's, it was kind of in the corner. It's kind of a yeah, 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 we're used to this one. yeah, so it's and it's a scenic area. Yeah, and I would think up here they probably had pretty good kill last last winter, right? So yeah. Yeah. Is that any any other questions? <laughs> Starting back up, I just have uh, maybe about 15 or so minutes of an overview here. So thank you very much to, to Dale and to Tim and to Andrea, our, our Vanna White, um, for all that wonderful information. What I'm going to do at the end of this is package everything up, all these materials. I need to ask Tim if it's okay if I send out the presentation. But um, I'll send all of those things to everybody if you provide an email. If you don't have an email address, I can uh, get your mailing address and send you hard copies, uh, just so everybody has the information and the contact info as well. Um, but my name is Sarah Johnson. I work for the Pennsylvania chapter of the Nature Conservancy, and I'm just going to do a quick overview of the program that has kind of sponsored this, this training, the U.S. Forest Service TNC strategy for hemlock conservation on the Highland Plateau of New York and PA. <coughs> Uh, so back in the, I guess, early 2000s or so, staff on the Allegheny National Forest were worried about the threat of hemlock woolly adelgid. They uh, wanted to work with their neighbors to address the threat because the best way to address an invasive pest is across ownership boundaries. The pest doesn't know those boundaries. Uh, so the one thing that was really an opportunity with the Allegheny National Forest is that there's a lot of private inholdings. So they wanted to work with all those neighbors and just do sort of a landscape scale uh, strategy for, for conservation in the face of, of this threat. So in late 2012, the Allegheny National Forest brought in the Nature Conservancy, myself uh, and my colleague Scott Bearer, to sort of administer the development of a cooperative area landscape scale <coughs> to address the threat of HWA. The landscape that we selected is outlined here in red. It's the High Allegheny Unglaciated Plateau sub eco region. <coughs> Big Mountain Hole usually just call it the High Allegheny. Uh, that was chosen because it's a relatively 
um, you know, kind of nice sized area to work in. It's about two and a half million acres, as well as it's an ecologically connected area. So that was our the boundary of our uh, initiative. As of that time, late 2012, no HWA had been found inside that boundary. The nearest infestation was on state forest lands have been found, uh, Elk State Forest in Elk County. Uh, so when we were starting out, we were, were thinking we were ahead of the game. Our strategy had three sort of overarching goals. First, to establish collaboration across the plateau among public and private landowners. Second, identify hemlock across the plateau, both low and high levels of occurrence. That was supposed to be mostly a GIS mapping exercise, which was why I was hired as a conservation GIS analyst. Uh, and thirdly, to prioritize that hemlock for monitoring and treatment. For that first goal, establishing collaboration, this is a map of our collaborating landowners and land managers. Our whole collaboration encompasses over 50 entities, uh, public, private companies, uh, nonprofits, organizations, individuals, governmental officials, universities, academic institutions, etc. cetera. Um, but only a handful of those own and manage land in this Sabico region. But that handful represents uh, about 50% of that two and a half million acres. So a really kind of unique situation and great opportunity in this landscape. For our second goal, identifying hemlock across the plateau, uh, we really wanted that to happen with sort of a uniform data product, which was why it was going to be GIS mapping. There's lots of folks that have lots of uh, inventories and lots of data, uh, but we really wanted a uniform product across ownership boundaries, both collaborating and non-collaborating. So the way we were able to accomplish that was this product that we had access to from the Forest Service. A uh, division of the Forest Service called the Forest Health Technology Enterprise Team. So they're really smart people. Uh, they have this gridded data set of hemlock occurrence by basal area. So we, were, we had access to this product and it really helped us out. This was how we were able to uh, work together to prioritize across ownership boundaries. So this was a big deal for us to be able to have access to this data. And this is our result. This happened in August of 2013 at a collaborative workshop. Everyone got together and worked on different printed out big poster maps with the Forest Health uh, Technology Enterprise team data on it, as well as some other data. And they were able to use their knowledge as well as that data to outline hemlock conservation areas or HCAs. So these are our set of hemlock conservation areas for the High Allegheny and Glaciated Plateau, uh, delineated by the co uh, collaborative group. So some folks uh, kept things pretty, pretty large scale. We have some really large areas, and some people were pretty specific. Uh, so to sort of preserve all that detail, what I did was digitize the landscape areas as our, as our large areas, the light blue, and then maintain the focal areas within them, the dark blue, where, uh, where folks have delineated more, more high priority areas in many cases. All right, just to summarize our current level of threat here, this is not official in any way, shape, or form. Uh, DCNR, <coughs> DCNR keeps the um, official infestation map for Pennsylvania and maintains that for their records. But this is just what I use for uh, monitoring and risk assessment purposes. So in March of 2013, here's our closest known, November 2012, when we sort of got started. Uh, March of 2013 was when we found uh, HWA down here in Cook Forest State Park. And then following that, several other discoveries were made up along the Allegheny River, more discoveries along the Clarion, and then uh, in Tainas, the Scenic Research Natural Area. That was the very light infestation that uh, we haven't been able to refine since the last two harsh winters, um, but most certainly still around there. Uh, also up here in Allegheny State Park, which has some really excellent eastern hemlock old growth, they have several infestations. That up, that's not up to date. They have um, maybe three or three to five more areas where they have found HWA. So lately here in the um, sort of 2014-2015 monitoring season, November to March, 
uh, the infestations have been located further north up into New York. There's um, an infestation identified in Fredonia, New York, along the Lake Erie coast, and in the Zor Valley multiple use area that's about an hour or so south of Buffalo. Uh, and people have been really actively addressing both of those areas as well. Uh, but the new infestations have sort of been cropping up uh, a bit further north. All right, so that was our first phase. That's, uh, you know, that's um, what we did there in 2013 and the early part of 2014. So our next phase, we've been a little slow getting going, uh, but our next phase is to continue and to increase our volunteer monitoring program, which you all now, wittingly or unwittingly, are a part of. I have your emails. <laughs> Not that that's going to result in problems, but um, that is, has been a really uh, great program. There's been a lot of people involved, a lot of people really <coughs> psyched and helpful with this. Um, the other piece is the formation of a cooperative forest pest management area. Cooperative management areas are basically sort of a landscape scale effort involving um, many landowners, public and private that have a common goal that they're all working towards. So our common goal is hemlock conservation uh, with the threat of HWA, right? So our cooperative forest pest management area will allow us to use our established collaboration network, our established um, sort of boundary of our effort to implement plans on both public and private lands, cross boundary plans. And we're talking uh, chemical treatments, biological releases, uh, possibly some beneficial silvicultural prescriptions, uh, Etc. As, as many um, uh, as many weapons in our arsenal that we can implement, we're gonna we're gonna work with our cooperators on that within this boundary. So this sort of pre-work of prioritization, as well as the formation of our cooperative area, gives us a better chance for funding, especially with the Forest Service, uh, and a better chance in the long run, really, to make a difference. So right now. Obviously we're focusing on HWA, but we'll be able to use the same network to address other pests, such as other pests of hemlock, the long day scale, et cetera, or uh, red ash borer, and whatever else might bombard us in the future. <coughs> so this is a map of our HCAs, the same HCAs, and the turquoise ones have been adopted by volunteer monitors. The pink ones have not yet been adopted. Um, so about 50 out of our 146 total, we have somebody yearly monitoring in them for the presence or absence of hemlock woolly adelgid. That represents about 175,000 acres that have been adopted. And we've received over 75 reports from these volunteer monitors that have signed up to adopt these areas. They've been <coughs> really, really helpful. Really, the vast majority of the infestations that we know about have been located with volunteers or folks just out recreating, knowing what they're looking for. So this is really important, really highlights uh, <coughs> how crucial you know, people getting out and looking and knowing what they're looking for and reporting back to us, how crucial that is. Uh, <laughs> this is blank. So <laughs> that is up until now. That is where we are right now. Um, and throughout the, the sort of the latter half of that process, the Allegheny National Forest has taken our priority hemlock conservation areas and been working on uh, their own, uh, you know, really focused, really comprehensive strategy. So I was going to have Andrea say a couple minutes about yeah, this. Is my blank slide. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, that's my bad. Um, we didn't communicate <laughs> well ahead of time. So. Uh, yeah, on the Allegheny National Forest, we've been working on preparing an environmental assessment um, to, to consider the environmental effects of proposed treatments, including insecticides and the, um, the biological controls, the beetles um, that Tim spoke about earlier. So we hope to have a decision on that document by this spring in time for us to be able to start implementing some treatments this coming field season. And um, it incorporates all of the priority conservation areas that were brought, um, identified by the public, by co cooperators when we had this hemlock collaboration strategy. And Sarah didn't mention, but you know, we had these workshops when we looked at delineating important hemlock conservation areas. We had laid out um, 
high quality trout streams, um, TNC element occurrences, so maybe red <coughs> or dragonfly populations or um, things that are unique like that, <coughs> recreation areas, areas where the hemlock's aesthetic, you know, important to the aesthetics of the area, of course, old growth, the heart's content and tie and ester were identified. And so the um, Basically, that's where we're at on the national forest. For all the other ownerships, you know, they don't really need to go through this environmental assessment. They're free to um, try and treat their areas. You know, but it made sense to us to treat, as Sarah pointed out, across ownerships. And we even went up into New York State. New York State collaborated on this on this whole project. So I don't know if you guys have any questions, but uh, Sarah just wanted me to provide you an update. And the EA is online it will oh yeah it will be it will be on our website and the, there's already the what's called a scoping letter which is um, where we uh, propose to the public how we would like to treat these the uh, hemlock woolly adalgid in these areas in order to keep hemlocks alive uh, so that's on our website the scoping letter is what it's called and then the document itself will be posted there and right now there is um, a set of interactive maps that uh, I was pretty excited about it. You can go on our website and you know those those some of these areas have lots <coughs> on a map where you can zoom in pretty closely on the on our website and look at the maps much more closely than even what you can see in the back of the room. So I can ask Sarah to send you guys a link. She'll have yeah. a mailing list for you guys if you're interested mm -hmm. in checking that out. I'll definitely include that with all the materials from so that was all I had. That was yeah. Like slide. Yeah, and I wanted to maybe just give an overview. She's obviously more familiar with what the Forest Service has to go through, but they have a pretty involved process, and it's much different than what other folks uh, need to deal with as far as red tape. Um, so the timing of things is going yeah. to be a bit different. You know, and I just want to I want to say something else. Um, I was thinking about earlier. Sorry. Okay. I'll come back up. So, you know, this whole concept of how do we treat this introduced invasive insect, you know, we're talking about insecticide treatments, uh, release of biocontrols, uh, oftentimes they're also introduced insects, um, but the way I, I look at it is really, the, if we don't do anything, we know the trees are going to die. They, they will die eventually, and it might take longer, and it probably will take a lot longer here than it did in the southern Appalachians. But um, this buys us time for research. There's all kinds of ongoing research. They're looking at um, fungal controls that are specific to hemlock woolly adalgid. So I look at it, this is buying us time. So if we keep uh, important groves of hemlocks alive, then we bought, you know, and we're buying time for those trees for the research community to catch up for hopefully something that's more effective on a landscape scale. Because obviously treating individual trees in a landscape is costly and probably not, you know, it's something very difficult to maintain in the long term. Right. So right. That's, I wanted to add that. Sorry. Yeah, and that's a great point. Um, <coughs> the final, sort of the, the end <coughs> solution that DCNR and the Forest Service and New York DEC and New York State Parks are shooting for as well is that biocontrols will be what what is used to manage hemlock woolly adelgid populations. We're not going to eradicate it. Basically, the long-term goal is a balance between the health of hemlocks, uh, H2B populations, and their predator populations. We have to move forward. With. We're never going to get rid of HWA. Uh, so biocontrols take a long, long time, but you know people will keep priming the ecosystem, keep doing releases. We'll try to get some releases uh, spread around on our private lands. That's a little bit <laughs> not really get many releases or any on private lands without paying a lot, a lot of money. Um, but there's DCNR is establishing field and sectories for these, these predators that hopefully eventually we'll be able to collect from and just and, and take to private lands as well as public. So, so what does the landscape look like in Japan where you have uh, native predators that deal with that? What kind of more quality do you see there? For uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in that case, you have a, like a, uh, you have a long history of these two species. 
resistances together. So the trees, all of them are basically resistant except for Carolina and Eastern. Okay. So there's a, you have predators there and you have a higher level of resistance in the tree. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So it's a much better situation. Yeah. Um, so looking looking at the trees, they generally look healthy, but the bugs there, but that's because they don't. Yeah, it's in the, <coughs> the tree. It's the the fact that the eastern hemlock has no his evolutionary history with this instance, so there's no resistance in the tree, and there's no. But it's also there's no predators here. There is uh, this another. So for example, that genus is Laracobius. They don't even they don't have common names for these beetles. And so it's and the one from the West Coast is Negritus, Laracobius Negritus, and the other one from Japan is Laracobius osakensis. There's a beetle lot that eats the pine bark adelgid called the Laracobius rubidus. And they will eat the adelgid, can, but it doesn't eat enough because it's not that's not, not its normal thing. To these Negritis and Osakensis are used to spending their whole lives in the way. So they do a lot more. Delicious. You said it costs a lot. What is what is what it cost? Full bucks. For a private person. I'm not sure. Yeah. So well, how much did it cost you? It cost well it didn't cost us anything, but that's because there's a reason for that, because then we as when we get that ball, we agree that we're going to go there and monitor for the next several years or for the next decade. So there are things we do in return when we set that data. They send us the data. So there's we not. Monitor. Monitor. But, still, but still, so there's a catalog. Yeah, but I mean, she's right. Get a, get a ball because we were actually, so me and Jim were out, what was that, last week? We we're trying to we we're trying to get this field insect replanted this coming spring. And the idea is more of these beetles into that and start producing what we can spread around. The all, another thing which we haven't even talked about is that this program would allow, and that I've done, I was going to about this, <laughs> but it's actually something for me, is that what we can do with in this area, like we can all agree, like when I get beetles, I can agree that they will go into this area. So then that's, the more beetles you pour in, the well, faster spread. they start to establish and start to spread. So, <laughs> do you have a hedge of hemlock? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they'll get this beetle, they'll get the beetle just like HWA doesn't no boundary, so it's going to spread right. privately. Populations build up, they'll they can move pretty decently far. So even if we're only allowed to release on public lands, they'll go out and be on the private lands. That's the whole idea. But the yeah. and that down in the Banner Elk, in North Carolina, mm -hmm. it's like a ski area. This is actually working very well down there. But they will. Um, you could. I don't know the exact radius of this area, but I think it's 20 or 30 miles across. Where you can go out from Hemlock where you go find a delta. But you'll also find these beetles eating as they do. Because the adelgid had a head start, these I wouldn't say they're the greatest looking hemlocks I've ever seen, but they are important. They do have, they're covered with new growth, so they are look better than they do around State College here. Where these people are established. It just takes a long time, like at least a decade, I would say, of releases, at least to get so to the get one. That's one, like one thing, I don't know whether it is right now, is the Forest Service is releasing beetles on the A&F, right? But, I mean, what that's we could do is... That's the EPA, right? It's a that's proposal in the document that I mentioned earlier. Right, so hopefully... Yeah, we don't have approval right now. What we might be able to do is I could, when I get beetles, I can combine them with whatever they get, and then we could do these big releases. So yeah. instead of releasing 500, we can't do <laughs> Three thousand or five thousand or something like that. And it'll still still exist. Yeah, yeah. They, this one that. No, I mean in that quantity, or they yeah, have to be hatched or grown or whatever. They're sent to multiple states, so yes. And especially if you had two, like in this case, we'd have multiple groups cooperating, so we 
we would expect to be able to get something like that. Not always. Sometimes there's a disaster. They, they can, sometimes there's diseases or something, but that's, I think they have to they, Yeah, they're always putting wild material into it to keep the genetics good, but it's the lab, so it's always possible. But they've been working on those in Florida. We think they have them ironed out, but that's my pessimistic point. Yeah. My optimistic stuff is that it should be bad enough. Am I talking too much? No, no, this is great. This, 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 there's always two other thing is there's multiple other biological control things coming up. Like there's one being researched at Penn State right now that's native to China uh, that they've been working on for years. Uh, and then there's actually another this in this kind of career. It's one of the people that's the yeah. So actually that's two. There's a lot and then of people. Fly, and then there's the fungal yeah. thing that she was talking the about, which is an aerial <coughs> fungus. The fungus gets in and kills everything that's in the, the egg, the woolly sack. Yeah, and it's actually, uh, the fungus is, they, well, they, they were using, there's been some hitches in that program, but the fungus that they were using was actually one that was generated in Europe for, uh, I believe it was being used in organic farming. So it's, uh, Um, no, no worries. I, and this stuff will have more information if you would like to be uh, blasted with information via email. You know, we try to send stuff out whenever there's new developments uh, and things of that nature. Um, but just to to get into the sort of the last part of tonight, this is the very last thing. What we have asked folks to do, and it's perfectly fine if you don't want to adopt an area for yearly monitoring. We're just happy that you now you know, would know what you're looking for, might be on the lookout when you're out on your property or wherever you might be recreating. That would, that would be great, just to get more eyes on the ground, more people out there aware. Uh, but if you would like to adopt a priority area for yearly monitoring, we have a protocol we ask that you use. It's very simple. Uh, it's uh, it's, it's, it's quick, it's easy, it's um, not a big deal. And then we have some maps in the back, and I have some maps on Andrea's computer that if you want to look at a certain area closer, see who owns a certain area, as far as our collaborating ownerships or anything like that, we can look at those maps. And then if you'd like to choose an area and sign up, we can sign you right up tonight. Um, but again, no pressure, no worries. The main thing is just to, to that you know what this is, what it's doing, what you're looking for. Um, if you're going to be looking in New York, I think we had some folks that were going to come from New York that didn't make it, but if you're going to be looking in New York on uh, private lands or state forests, this website has the uh, New York DTC contacts for you, and uh, I'll, be, I'll send this out again so you have this link. Um, if you're going to be looking to state parks, if you want to volunteer to help in Lushworth or Allegheny State Park, email Bob O'Brien and Alyssa Reed, or if you're just in a state park, and you think you found a Delgin, also email Bob and Alyssa. They're the uh, New York State Parks Invasives folks. Um, for the protocol, I'm going to come back here. So this, yeah, we have some printed out, not that many, uh, if you want a hard copy today, but I will be emailing it also. Um, this protocol is really, really simple. It was developed by uh, Northeastern Area State and Private. And even if you don't want to uh, adopt an area, um, it's pretty short. <coughs> pages. It has a lot of information about, you know, about the insects and for your reference. Um, you know, get some background, the purpose, determine whether or not HWA is present in the area that you're sampling what you should be looking for and how, where you should select for your site to look, how many trees to examine. This is the protocol for adopting. Um, but again, there's there's stuff in here. If you don't adopt an area, there's still some good information. Like, um, if you think you found HWA, do not move it. Don't take a sample. Um, check your arms for crawlers, <coughs> tins carrying them everywhere. Um, don't, like, don't do anything with it. If you have a GPS unit or your smartphone, take a waypoint, 
or if you know like how many paces in what direction you were from a, a road or a trail or a stream, if you have some flagging, maybe flag it, uh, then somebody can refine that spot to confirm or, or disconfirm the finding. Uh, also, um, oh, that was it. No, so yeah, if you want to adopt an area, this is uh, this is the protocol I'll ask you to use, and I will send that out uh, for everybody. Uh, and also, again, even if you don't adopt an area, and if you do, here's the contact information. I'm going to send this out as well. Um, Tim and Jim are here in the western area, most of most of this area, and Brad Regester is in the northern area. So if you're looking on state or privately owned lands in Pennsylvania, those are your contacts. Um, all suspected detections on the Allegheny should be sent to Andrea uh, Hilly. And really, if you're looking anywhere and you're not sure, and if you email Tim, Andrea, and I, uh, we will get the information to the correct person. So. Um, kind of anybody, as long as you tell somebody and know the location and are able to communicate that location. Uh, and this is a, a sheet that I'll send out as well to everybody. Um, uh, and maps, we got a ton of maps. This is a map that we have in the back. Uh, I have some more maps that show ownership and there's some other maps that Andrea brought in the back as well that we can look at, Andrea. And um, these are huge links, but I'll send this out too if you wanna look more closely, see what streams are running through, uh, see more features about <coughs> these areas. They are on a web map that you can access uh, through the top link there. So I'll send that out so you'll have the link to, to the online web map. No special software needed, just the internet. And you can kind of zoom in on these areas and take a, a closer look. Um, so that's all I have. Really want to thank and, and just highlight how awesome all of our uh, partners have been, especially two uh, big sources of our expertise were uh, DCNR Forestry and State Parks and the U.S. Forest Service divisions that we've been working with. And thanks to all of our speakers, to Dale, Tim, and Andrea, and thanks to Ned Carver with Kane Hardwoods for getting us this great venue. Um, and, and that's all I have, and now we can have some questions and then maybe look at some maps and have some more cookies. <laughs> Do we have any questions? It sounds dumb, but you shouldn't just like scratch them off when you see them. Do not touch mm -hmm. William Belgium. Like, you know, my, my gut instinct is to just rip them off and have them on the paper. Um, yeah, no, and the thing is, if you're monitoring from November to March, when they're in wool, the crawler stage isn't going on. So if you scrape them off, uh, they won't, you sh they shouldn't be able to go anywhere. If you scrape them off, they will die because they won't be feeding. Um, but then it's much harder to confirm or disconfirm that that was actually HWA and that it might be a new infested. So, so don't do that. Yeah, don't, don't touch. <laughs> good, good thought. Kind of a scorched earth, but yeah, don't do that. <laughs> too, too much handling time. <laughs> it's just, just the, the best thing to do <coughs> is to just leave it there and make sure somebody can refine it. So if you've got like, if you don't want to deal with GPS and you don't want to deal with a smartphone or whatever, anything that could take a waypoint or something. Um, some flagging, and I was up stream name X about a quarter mile from the road name X uh, and the tree slide, or something like that. Something as simple as that is fine too for, for somebody to be able to go out and confirm what you found. Anything else? Okay, before everybody leaves, I want to thank everyone here again for your time this evening. Yes. I know it was a little long and hopefully it was educational and, and everybody learned something. And if you don't adopt an area, at least um, you know what to look for and where to report it. So really, I do appreciate your time. Yeah, and if anybody didn't get the, the sign-in sheet to put your email down there, I'll be using that email list to send everybody the information and the presentations. Um, so make sure you get on that. And yeah, thank you all very much for your time and for your interest in in our in Hemlock conservation. Yeah. Thank you.